Yes, we're continuing our Sunday School series, A Theology of Public Life, Lessons for Lot in the City of Sodom. And we are 15th lesson now on historical, not 15th lesson on historical development. We're in our 15th lesson, which deals with the historic development, historical development of a theology of public life. And um, uh, hopefully this is helpful to you. Oh, thank you, brother, for reminding me. If you are here and you would like to pursue membership, we have a membership class that's going on over in the corner here uh, by the church office, Classroom 1. And so let me encourage you to be a part of that class if you're pursuing membership. And we want to encourage you to pursue membership. So uh, they're going to meet with the essentials over there. Okay, um, so historical development. Uh, I had a, um, a good friend of our church who um, has been listening online, those kinds of things. And I haven't had a chance to text him back yet, uh, but he texted me the other day and uh, was uh, joking around uh, calling me a, a history professor <laughs> on Sunday mornings because of these lessons, the last three lessons or so. And uh, in many respects, that's the way it's going to be for the next couple of lessons, including this morning. We get a little bit of church history. Um, but one of the reasons that we do that is because we're building to a point, right? We're building a case, so to speak. And we're getting to the point where, uh, in particular, uh, after after Luther and the Reformers, in the thought of, we'll find soon, uh, John Locke and our founders, uh, the founding of our government, uh, as we go through and work through how they thought of civil government, civil authority, and how they um, developed what we would call a political theology, um, their understanding of government, their understanding of the Christian's relationship to the government is developing and is maturing. And we can see that. We'll see that some today as we work through um, the history again uh, from Augustine and Augustine's uh, City of God and how the Christian relates to civil authority through the Middle Ages, then into the Reformation period. Um, we're going to see the church, as it were, mature in its political theology, mature in its uh, public theology. And so uh, it helps us to see that um, because we're going to think through those things ourselves uh, when we come to making practical application of this in our own church. And so I, I do think it, it um, makes it should, if you're, if you're thinking, if you're engaging, if you're working through the issues, you're thinking about the questions that they're thinking about. And most of the time, as we'll see today, there's this tug of war that goes on between uh, church and state. And that relationship, uh, the lines between that relationship, the boundaries around that relationship are slowly being clarified, slowly being um, explained. And um, it helps us to be able to think about those questions too in developing our own theology of public life. So I pray that the history part of it, um, though relatively short, we'll have you know, four or five total lessons on this, will be helpful to you. So we'll do uh, today, we're going to look through the medieval period. Uh, next week, we're going to look at the Reformation. And then the week after, we'll get to our founding and our form of government uh, before we begin then talking about um, a theology of Christian resistance, uh, which will come. So in a few weeks, we'll get to that theology and we'll be able to uh, uh, help you with that. Okay, a theology of public life. Uh, we're in uh, the 15th lesson, historical development. Um, in a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the early church and those three great periods of persecution. Uh, last week, we looked at Constantine and Augustine. And today we come to the medieval period and uh, what we're calling the recovery of Aristotelian uh, politics or um, the writings of Aristotle were um, recovered or were given a, a new look during the medieval, medieval period. And we'll talk about that this morning. Okay, so here's our history lesson, history lesson for Sunday school today. Um, Augustinian thought regarded, uh, regarding civil government it began uh, with Augustine's um, Augustine's lengthy treatise entitled The City of God in 410 AD, uh, following the sack of Rome by the Visigoths. Uh, would be Augustinian thought in one form or another that would then dominate uh, political thought for the next thousand years, um, up through the period of the Reformation. Uh, government was instituted by God uh, to restrain evil, and so in that sense, government was God's minister for good. We learned that in Romans 13. Uh, but government was a mechanical necessity, not a natural necessity. In other words, governments were put in place because of the fall of man and because of the propensity of man to sin, governments instituted by God to restrain corruption, to restrain evil. But because civil government or civil authority, although it was instituted by God, civil government is a part of Augustine's uh, city of man. And being a part of the city of man, uh, civil government, civil authority is susceptible to uh, sin, original sin in particular in Augustine's thought. Uh, and so government, therefore, naturally, you could say, 
as a consequence of the fall, uh, naturally turns evil, naturally turns corrupt. Governments inevitably become then organized oppression, maintaining power through coercion, in Augustine's words, coercion, uh, threats, and violence. And we see that in world history. It's not uncommon, and governments tend to devolve, okay? And so uh, Augustine, you would say, had this pessimistic understanding of government, and it was that Augustinian um, uh, pessimism that would sort of flavor how people thought about civil authority for a thousand years. It would be uh, fifth and sixth century popes, beginning with Gelasius I, that would then begin to exert ecclesiastical authority over governments, over civil uh, government, and led to the two swords theory that we talked about briefly last week. God has given two swords to the church, Gelasius would say, the greater for its sacred jurisdiction, the lesser sword for its secular jurisdiction, and the church then lends the lesser sword to the state, so to speak, and maintains ultimate authority over both, putting the Pope not only over the uh, entire church, but also the entirety of the earth's civil authority, civil government. I think that's what Gelasius was after. Uh, so after Gelasius, then the tug of war between the jurisdictions of church and state get heated up. And there's this tug of war that takes place between mainly between popes and civil government with respect to jurisdiction and authority, um, in particular, the authority of the state. So um, church-state relations then during the Middle Ages, during this period, uh, during this tug of war, saw a not only a, a, a broad expansion, if you will, of civil authority into the affairs of the church, but also saw a very broad expansion, expansion of papal authority into the affairs of state. In other words, the, the jurisdictions, the landmarks, if you will, are virtually gone in several of these cases. And you see uh, civil authority, civil government uh, overstepping its bounds outside of its jurisdiction, exercising the authority where it should not. But you also see the same kind of tyranny, so to speak, on the part of the church doing the same thing, overflowing its boundaries into the jurisdiction of the state and exercising an authority where it ought not. And so uh, several circumstances then uh, contributed to that tug of war. First, uh, oddly enough, one of the things that contributed to the tug of war was that emperors began to appoint bishops to positions within civil government. Uh, this began slowly, uh, but then erupted into what is called the investiture uh, controversy. We'll talk about that in a minute. But it began with popes. If, if uh, church authorities, church figures were under, so to speak, the civil governance, the civil protection of the state, uh, then the state had the authority to appoint church leaders, church officers. Many church officers, church leaders were given positions in civil government. And if they were under their leaders in civil government, then those leaders had the right to dictate their affairs in ecclesial government as well. And so we saw this expansion of power on the part of the state begin that way. A transitional figure in this development was a Benedictine monk named Gregory would later be called by the Catholic Church Gregory the Great, if you've heard that name before. Uh, Gregory was appointed by the Emperor Justin to be prefect or mayor of Rome. Uh, numerous attacks on the city of Rome had led to a void of leadership, and so Emperor Justin appointed Gregory, who was a monk, over um, Rome as mayor of Rome in 573 AD, highest civil position in the city. So Gregory, a Benedictine monk, found himself then in charge of things like grain stores and taxes and helping the poor and building and water supply and things like that. He became a civil authority. Um, after stepping down from that post, uh, Pope Gelasius made him a, a deacon in the church, and he became an ambassador to the imperial court in Constantinople, so still involved in politics. And then immediately after he became a deacon, the plague broke out. If you remember the stories of the plague, um, I heard one guy describe it, one uh, historian describe it as um, uh, began with a tickle in the throat and then black eruptions followed by death. <laughs> and the plague just swept across Europe, killing millions. Uh, plague broke out, uh, and that plague followed by devastating attacks from the Lombards. If you remember last week, we talked about the sack of Rome by the Visigoths. Well, another Germanic tribe called the Lombards uh, also uh, began to attack Rome. Their, their 
purpose was to um, take over Italy, essentially, and so began to attack um, uh, around Italy and made their way to Rome. And the Roman Empire, as a result of these attacks, as a result of the plague, as a result of the crumbling civil authority in the Roman Empire, uh, the Roman Empire was in chaos. Uh, it was in swift decline. And Gregory is quoted to have said this. I thought this was interesting. What is it that can be? Uh, what is it that can at this time delight us in this world? Everywhere we see tribulation. Everywhere we see we hear lamentation. You think about the circumstances that we find ourselves in today. And I hear, I've, 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 I know I've said it, I've heard others say it, like how much worse can it get, right? Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be coming back quickly, certainly. You know, it's like this, things have deteriorated to such a point that it's, it's so awful, so terrible. Well, think about Gregory at this time period and what they must have thought. You know, think about what uh, saints uh, during the period of the Second World War, First World War, what they thought at that time, seeing the world on fire, so to speak. Um, they're thinking the same way that we often think today. Certainly, uh, the Lord will come back soon. There's always been this, this doctrine of the imminent return, the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was no exception in Gregory's day. What is it, Gregory said, uh, that can delight us in this world? Everywhere we see tribulation, everywhere we hear lamentation. The city are destroyed, the castles torn down, the fields laid waste, the land made desolate, villages are empty, few inhabitants remain in the cities, and even these poor remnants of humanity are daily cut down. The scourge of celestial justice does not cease because no repentance takes place under the scourge. We see how some are carried into captivity, others mutilated, others slain. What is it, brethren, that can make us contented with this life? If we love such a world, we love not our joy but our wounds. Right? So Gregory sort of lamenting the state of the Roman Empire at the time. Um, and it's what prompted Gregory to be a very fastidious uh, civil magistrate, uh, civil authority, and so um, worked tire tirelessly um, to do his job well in that capacity. Uh, the church at Rome was one of the very few institutions uh, that seemed to survive the attacks of that day. And at the death of Pope Gelasius, Gregory was then elevated to the papacy. Um, virtually in the place then, and this is where this, this transition begins to take place, this tug of war, uh, in the place of an established, uh, decisive, assertive, strong civil authority, uh, the church began to take control. Um, and the church was seen as a strong, decisive authority. So um, virtually in the place of civil government, uh, Pope Gregory now began to acquire land. Um, Pope Gregory uh, acquired a great deal of land, and the church became, uh, even at that time, uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, landowner in the Roman Empire. Uh, Pope Gregory formed a militia, a standing army, if you will, to defend uh, Italy, but also the interests of the church against attacks by the Lombards. Uh, he began to tax the population in order to support these efforts. And you can see how the, the lines are incredibly blurred, right? All of a sudden, now we've got this is, uh, you know, in the mind of the Catholic Church, the head of the church uh, exercising this kind of civil authority and jurisdictions are being blended, uh, acquiring land, developing a standing army, army, and now taxing the population in order to support it. Um, Gregory then began to appoint governors, began to appoint prefects, negotiated peace with Lombard leaders. So he's acting far less like a pope now and acting far more like an emperor or a governor. Um, after Gregory or during this period of tug of war, following Gre Gregory's example, uh, the Pope really was no longer strictly or merely an ecclesial or ecclesiastical office exercising an ecclesiastical authority. The church became, uh, in many ways, a civil authority. Largest landowner in the empire, standing armor, army. Pope became as much a political figure as he was anything else, and that all over Europe. He wasn't confined to a you know, small area there around Rome, all over Europe, all over the West, the Pope began to exercise civil authority. Boundaries are broken down, spheres of jurisdiction becoming confused. Okay, second then, first period under Gregory. The second 
Uh, that tug of war, the rope was pulled in the opposite direction, so to speak, and power pulled back by the emperor at the early part of the 8th century. Earlier part of the 8th century, we're going to move toward the Reformation. Emperor Leo III, on the heels of a significant military victories, asserting power of the Roman army, began to enforce his religious convictions. So now you have an emperor who, uh, exerting uh, force over the empire, now begins to enforce his religious convictions as well. And Pope Leo, or Pope Leo, it's more probably accurate, Emperor Leo <laughs> uh, had strong religious convictions. Uh, so he began to enforce those. He first commanded the forcible baptism of Jews and Montanists. Uh, Montanists were a, um, essentially a charismatic cult sect that claimed to be a part of the Catholic Church. Um, that I think actually practiced believers' baptism, and Jews, of course, needed to be baptized. And so uh, Emperor Leo commanded the forced baptism of as many Jews and Montanists as they could round up. Uh, the emperor decided that the church's use of icons or images venerated in worship was idolatrous, right? Uh, for whatever reason, he, he came to that good theology, that's true. Uh, and so in 730 A.D., Emperor Leo banned the use of icons and pictures in worship. Here's an emperor, but he's passing dictates um, for the church, uh, dictating how the church was to worship. This became known as the iconoclastic controversy, uh, controversy surrounding icons. It happened under, it developed over a century, but really came to a head with Emperor Leo here. The iconoclastic controversy made iconoclasm the official position of the church, uh, rounded up images, um, pictures, statues, icons, and had them destroyed, ordered the removal of images from churches, enforcing punishments if churches refused, even burning churches to the ground that refused. Um, so then Bishop Germanus of Constantinople refer refused, and so Leo then, Emperor Leo, replaced him with a bishop of his own choosing. <laughs> So Emperor Leo began to choose his own bishops, uh, began to appoint his own church leaders. So just as Gregory had begun to trend one direction, it became more and more and more and more civil, you could say, in his authority. We see the opposite thing happen now in the 8th century with Leo becoming more and more and more ecclesiastical in his authority, begins appointing leaders in the church of his own choosing. He threatened uncooperative ecclesial authorities with beatings, torture, and with imprisonment and carried those out. Whereas popes used to look to the, the emperor for protection, the church really couldn't go to Emperor Leo for protection. Uh, so the popes began to look at the Frankish kings, these Germanic tribes, began to look to their kings for uh, protection, uh, including um, the Franks, who were a Germanic tribe at that time that had converted to Christianity. Um, and that under, uh, began with the work of Gregory, uh, converting these Germanic tribes to Christianity. And so under Leo, that sent church leaders scrambling for other civil authority to protect the church against Emperor Leo and ended up putting their trust in Germanic tribes. So then third, first Gregory, second, we see the pendulum swing all the way back out uh, to the other side with Emperor Leo. Third, and interesting, uh, the tug of war goes the other way with a later pope of the same name. Now it's not Emperor Leo III, it's Pope Leo III. And that in 795, 795 AD, Pope Leo III, elected as pope under the Frankish Carolingian king Charlemagne. You guys have heard the name Charlemagne from history. Uh, the pope was attacked on the streets of Rome, um, leading a parade after his victory over the in the election over the prior pope and forces of the prior, yes, they had forces, forces of the prior pope um, attacked Pope Leo on the streets of Rome and there, Charlemagne had troops in Rome at the time and the troops of Charlemagne came in and uh, rescued Pope Leo, defended Pope Leo. And so Charlemagne and Pope Leo became friendly. Um, the pope was then accused by his enemies and Charlemagne felt as though it was his responsibility uh, to do something about it, even though he wasn't sure that he had the right to 
um, bring or drag a pope into court. That's exactly what he did. So he brings uh, Pope Leo into court and has Pope Leo acquitted of all the accusations against him, establishing uh, more a um, connection there between Pope Leo and Charlemagne. Uh, but it also, what that also did was it set a precedent, and that was a carefully crafted precedent by Charlemagne, set a precedent that the Frankish king had authority over the head of the church uh, to sit in judgment of the Pope. Uh, so it established the authority of the state as supreme or superior over the authority of the church. So that wouldn't stand. And a couple of days later at uh, Christmas Mass, um, Pope Leo um, comes down the aisle with a crown in his hand and crowns Charlemagne, Holy Roman Emperor. Emperor. And so that sets the pre precedence, very, very uh, craftily um, schemed by Pope Leo, sets the precedence that the Pope has authority to make emperors. And so giving the church the highest or supreme authority over emperors. This little tug of war, tug of war back and forth. What's the tug of war about? It's about who has authority, who has jurisdiction over the affairs of state, over the affairs of church. When, and we've talked about this before in, in previous lessons, that there has been, there is in Scripture and has been in church history a clear understanding of the distinction between church and state. Not that they operate an absolution from one another or uh, entirely um, without regard for one another, but there are clear boundaries around civil authority, clear boundaries around ecclesiastical authority, and there is that separation that we find in Scripture that is to be honored. And when we see those boundaries, um, those jurisdictions blurred, uh, there's always trouble. And so th there's this constant tug of war through the medieval period related to that issue. And what's going to happen as we near the American colonies is that's going to become clearer and clearer. Those lines are going to become clearer and clearer. Um, what followed this issue, this tug of war between Pope Leo and Charlemagne, what was, call, what was called uh, the lay investiture controversy, which we referenced a minute ago, it's coming to a head now, where political authorities were appointing church leaders. Uh, bishops have been taking roles in civil government, which biblically is okay to do if you read our Confession of Faith. Um, under the chapter on the civil magistrate, it's good and acceptable for Christians to uh, take office uh, in civil government. But bishops began taking roles in civil government, coming under the higher authority of civil governing authorities above them. And those authorities began to presume to appoint leaders in the churches. And it began the lay investiture controversy. That controversy ended with a concordant of worms, of worms, 1122 AD. And that ended investiture, and they came to an agreement, uh, Pope and Emperor, that church authorities, church officers, would only be appointed by the church with the approval of the Pope. Um, these periods of tug of war, one side to the next, served to expose tyrants on either side. Um, we've talked about tyranny, an example of tyranny or the definition of tyranny, tyranny being when civil authority steps beyond the boundaries of its own jurisdiction to exercise an authority that it does not have in the jurisdiction of another, uh, that civil authority becomes tyrannical. That's an example of tyranny. And it's right for the church to push back. It's also right for the church to maintain her proper boundaries between church and state. Uh, and we'll, maybe we have an opportunity, um, I'm sure we will, uh, we'll take some time and talk particularly about theonomy and reconstructionism. We'll talk about some of those things um, in the future. So these, there were tyrants then uh, on either side, usurpers in ecclesiastical office violating the boundaries of their jurisdiction or usurpers in civil office violating the boundaries of their jurisdiction. Resistance against tyranny uh, took place outside the sphere of the church as well. In his book, uh, Slaying Leviathan, uh, Glenn Sunshine brings up the example of the Magna Carta. So if you were uh, at some point a high school uh, history student, <laughs> you surely have heard the word of the name, the Magna Carta. Uh, for the longest time, I couldn't remember anything about it. Just remember that name, the Great Charter. Um, the Great Charter, uh, 1215, we're nearing, we're getting, we're getting closer to the Reformation now, right? 1215 AD. Well, the Magna Carta was essentially um, a document that asserted barons' rights, feudal barons in England, 
asserted their rights, what they uh, described as natural rights, would later be called inalienable rights, asserted the natural rights of feudal barren lords against then a very tyrannical King John. And so the Magna Carta was drafted in order to set, as it were, um, it was barons resisting against the king. Uh, and they, it would have been termed at that time, they would have understood it to be Christian resistance. They had rights given them by God. that They were asserting their rights against King John. The Magna Carta also included um, assertions of church rights against King John, that King John was not the head of the church as he was acting to be. And so asserting personal, individual rights, asserting territorial rights, property rights, attorney, asserting liberty rights, and asserting church rights against a tyrannical King John. And that was the Magna Carta. Uh, this was the Magna Carta, one, an example of the governed pushing back against or resisting governmental overreach. So we've seen an example of that in the Magna Carta. Uh, Augustinian thought regarding checks on governmental power influenced the charter. So when uh, Augustine pessimistic about civil authority being able to keep itself in check. Augustine uh, spoke of checks and balances. The framers of the Magna Carta uh, picked up on Augustinian thought with respect to check, checks and balances. And Augustinian thought on checks and balances was inserted into, that was the, one of the foundations of the Magna Carta. And then third, the basis on which this resistance to tyranny took place uh, was an assertion of natural what they would call natural rights, what Aristotle called natural rights. Um, we would understand, we'll talk about that in a minute, we would understand natural rights a little differently. Uh, our founders would call them in inalienable or unalienable rights, um, natural rights. The argument for natural law and natural rights was in part due to the thinking of Aristotle. Um, that thinking was furthered in the 13th century by the medieval theologian Thomas Aquinas. All right before we get into natural rights, natural law, I've been rambling for a while. Any questions about any of that? I know we're getting a history lesson. Bear with me. In a, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be through the history. We'll get <laughs> back to uh, some good theology. This is helping us, I think, with our theology. Some right. This um, it's good to know church history. Really good to know church history, and good to know like. Uh, what the church struggled with, what people struggled with, what they went through and thought through. And, and in large respect, it, it um, helps us to avoid the same kinds of error in our thinking. And sometimes it causes us to say, what were they thinking? <laughs> How in the world did that ever happen? Um, gives us a, a great appreciation for the Reformation, <laughs> that, that period of a thousand years under uh, a growing, uh, encroaching Roman Catholicism. Finally, you get a, just a breath of fresh air at the Reformation, finally, uh, after a thousand years of that darkness. Um, so that's also very encouraging about church history. <laughs> Any questions or thoughts? Yeah, James. Uh, at this time, was the Bible still only held by the church? Yeah, very good question, and yes, yeah. So uh, church authorities... Um, for the longest time, there, there, uh, there were many in the earlier part of the church, uh, thousands of copies made, but even those copies, it wasn't common for a, a person to have a copy of the scriptures or a copy of a, a scroll of Isaiah, so to speak, uh, in their possession. Um, in the same way that the Jewish scriptures were copied very, very carefully, and then each synagogue would have had a set of scrolls. Um, often the copies were given to the church. And so if you wanted to hear the scriptures, you went to the church to hear them, uh, wherever the church met and whatever way the, the scriptures were read. And so your only access to the scriptures was the meeting place of the church. Uh, and that's the way that this persisted for until the time of the Reformation. Uh, and actually, I'm going to uh, mention a little bit about that in the sermon this morning because we're going to talk about the the great advantages, the, the tremendous advantages that the Jewish people had. Uh, Paul says, um, you know, uh, the, the Jewish objector asks, what advantage has the Jew then, right? What profit is there to circumcision? And uh, Paul says, much in every way, chiefly because to them were given the oracles of God. Um, so it's a tremendous blessing, a tremendous advantage to have the scriptures in that way. And for this period of time, uh, the church largely withholding uh, the scriptures from uh, the people uh, as a responsibility of the church. 
uh, and that was um, turned around at the Reformation. Um, and you saw, began to see uh, copies made, translations into English made. William Tyndale um, gave his life, gave his life so that we could have a copy of the Bible in English. Um, so, yeah, good question, brother. Any other questions? Okay, let's keep moving along then. Okay, let's talk about natural law, natural rights, uh, thinking of Aristotle. Um, Thomas Aquinas, 13th century theologian, wrote uh, a treatise called Summa Summa Theologiae, Theologiae, uh, about 10,000, um, no, it's far more than that. I'm drawing a blank now. Uh, 10,000 pages, I think is accurate. 10,000 pages to Summa Theologiae. Uh, Thomas Aquinas wrote um, much on the doctrine of God that we uh, can rely on uh, today, uh, some of that helpful, and he also uh, wrote much on a theology of public life and wrote much on a political uh, theory, the relationship of the church, the Christian, uh, to the state. And so uh, one of the things that uh, Aquinas did in developing his, his political thought was to uh, revive uh, the writings of Aristotle. And so Thomas Aquinas um, commissioned a translation of Aristotle, Aristotle's politics into Latin, I think that was 1260 AD, and it became the basis for much of Aquinas' thought writing on political theory uh, that would, would help us uh, later, our founders later on. Um, Aristotle, had based his theory of government or his theory of politics on what he called natural law, natural law. Um, Aquinas then gave us a biblical understanding of what natural law is. Um, natural law to Aristotle was something that developed naturally, so to speak. Uh, Aristotle was a secularist, but developed naturally, so to speak, um, through community. Uh, like many atheists would think today, right? We have our morality because morality over time just sort of develops as people get together and I don't like this done to me, you don't like that done to you, and so that's immoral, right? It's immoral for me to do this to you, it's immoral for you to do this. In other words, morality just sort of is nurtured in community as we live together in harmony. Um, sort of Aristotle's view of natural law, it comes about naturally. Uh, Thomas Aquinas understood natural law uh, to be written on the heart of man by God, made in God's image, right? That um, natural, like we've talked about when we went through uh, the law and gospel study here, which is a really fruitful study, really helpful study. Um, there was a, a distinction made between natural law and positive law, right? Natural law is that law of God, that law that um, reflects God's perfect nature, his perfect essence, his perfect being, uh, that law which represents the character of God naturally woven into the fabric of our DNA, so to speak, written on the heart of man at creation, such that Adam and his posterity um, would naturally, <laughs> naturally desire to obey um, because obedience to the natural law, to be obedience to that law was um, the highest good, would naturally obey. They had that law of God written on their heart. That law um, effaced, uh, dramatically corrupted at the fall, not done away with altogether. We still have, as Paul says, the work of the law written on our hearts, um, but uh, that law defaced, corrupted uh, by the fall. Nonetheless, that's natural law written on the heart of man as distinct from positive law, which was a law given. Um, for example, uh, natural law represented by the Ten Commandments or summarized by the Ten Commandments. Uh, you then have, have positive laws, like for example, a positive part of the Fourth Commandment, uh, for example, for the Jews was to worship on Saturday. These six days you'll work, this day you'll rest. Uh, in the New Testament, we see that day um, by positive precept, by positive commendation, example in Scripture, moved to the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, Sunday. Uh, it's a positive part of that natural law that we rest one day in seven. Make sense? The distinction between natural law and positive law, okay? So Aristotle based his theory of politics on natural law, these natural laws that rise up that governments don't have to put in place. These things are naturally in place, so to speak. And what was fascinating about... Uh, and you can find this in Sunshine's book, um, Sunshine. Um, read Sunshine's book. 
It's like you, you call your son or daughter Sunshine. Sun, good morning, Sunshine. This is a book by Glenn Sunshine. He's a good author. Read him. Um, Aristotle's uh, uh, talk about government in that book is really helpful, really fascinating. Um, Aristotle basically saw three forms of government. Um, and these forms are seen in our, the formation of our own government, right? So think with me for a moment. Um, three forms of government um, conceived of by Aristotle. One was a monarchy, pretty clear, right? Ruled by a single individual. Um, but that monarchy ruled by a single individual, if that single individual rules for self-interests or for self-indulgence, lusts, then rather than ruling for the common good of the people, which is what government is to be for, they're, as we would say, ministers of God for good, if that ruler, monarch, rules for self-interest, then it devolves into tyranny, right? Monarchy devolves into tyranny. The second form of government was an aristocracy ruled by a few, not one individual, but by a few, an aristocracy. And when that aristocracy no longer governs for the common good of the people, but rather governs for self-good, self-indulgence, that aristocracy devolves into an oligarchy. An oligarchy. It's basically tyranny of the few. A third form of government was a republic, which is ruled by representation. Rule by representation. But when representative rule (laughs) represents a mob that is more controlled by passion and emotion than they are by reason, then that republic devolves into democracy. Now, that's interesting. We're used to thinking of democracy as something good, all right? But in, um, republic is the good form of the government, which is, that's why we have a constitutional republic here in the United States. Uh, area. Amen. We have a constitutional republic. Aristotle saw that, and rightfully so, saw that as um, when that representation breaks down and that representation becomes um, representative of mob rule, a rule by passion, ruled by self-indulgence, rather than rule for the common good of the people, then that republic breaks down into democracy, literally mob rule. And so Aristotle feared, saw uh, the potential for, in that case, um, a demagogue, literally a mob boss, (laughs) a mob ruler, mob leader, um, stirring up the passions of the mob uh, to get the mob to act out of emotion, act out of passion rather than acting out of reason. We see that example all over the place too, don't we? Uh, The first example that comes to mind for me was the the Jews crucifying the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who for envy the Jewish leaders stirring up the passion of the mob and the mob out acting out of passion and emotion rather than reason, falsely crucified the Christ, right? Um, Aristotle saw the danger of mob psychology, is what that is, mob psychology. And we see mob psychology today um, in spades, don't we? Uh, college campuses, it's amazing how um, absolutely um, unable to reason and and. What often happens is uh, an inability to win an argument on the merits leads to silencing your opposition, shouting down your opposition, Uh, mob rule, so to speak, ensues, and you're pushing speakers off college platforms at events on college campuses, right? Um, We see that today in our day. Uh, Aristotle's fear of mob rule, and increasingly so. Uh, you get mob rule right now in like cities like Portland. <laughs> uh, it's incredulous to me that that's taking place in our country. But what um, those who saw, for example, Aristotle, um, and Aristotle wasn't the first, but in looking at a monarchy, looking at an aristocracy, looking at um, republic, the devolution of those three forms of government was inevitable. That a monarchy will inevitably become tyranny. An aristocracy will inevitably become an oligarchy, and a republic will inevitably become mob rule, Um, either mob rule, uh, chaos and anarchy, or mob rule that necessitates despotism and totalitarianism. But one way or another, it devolves, and why? Why? 
It's back to Augustinian pessimism. It's because of original sin, the fall of man. Man is sinful. Governments require a populace to be, and this is in the words of, of Thomas Aquinas, require a populace to be virtuous in order for the government to succeed. If the populace isn't virtuous, then the government will devolve um, and eventually lead to despotism, lead to totalitarianism, lead to anarchy, to chaos. And we see that throughout history. And uh, um, for all of its checks and balances, we see that happening in our country today. Don't we? We see that very thing happening in our country today. And um, because those checks and balances are not sufficient to restrain the sin of man, it will devolve, right? It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, right? Um, each of those forms of government, Aristotle would say, had strengths and weaknesses, right? Um, a monarch could act swiftly, act de decisively, but because he's acting alone, he often would act foolishly, right? An aristocracy could act a little swifter, but weren't didn't always have the interests of all the people or the common good in mind as much as maybe they had their own interests in mind, like a bunch of feudal barons pushing back against King John, right? Had their own interests in mind. Uh, or your representative form of government, really good, a republic in the sense that it, it represented the interests of the common good, but acted really slowly and really painfully sometimes to get through administrations before a new representative government could be formed. Each had their strengths, each had their weaknesses. Um, the ideal state, in the ideal state, in Aristotle's thinking, uh, Aquinas, people are virtuous. Uh, the next best state, best next, next best civil authority would be a civil authority that represented all three forms of government. Think with me, okay? Would be a blend, if you will, of all three, with checks and balances put in place. So a blend of monarchy, aristocracy, and republic. Um, and if you think about it, our government is an attempt, our founders, reading Aristotle, reading Aquinas, an attempt to put all three in place. Monarchy, represented by the president. The aristocracy, not a representative body, but one of... Uh, leadership by the few, rulers rule by a few, represented by the, the Senate, and then representative government, republic, represented by House of Congress, right? So yeah, so we, what our founders attempted to do was to uh, put all three forms in place at once to serve as a checks and balances against the other, and out of the judicial branch, which uh, needs a checks and balances of its own. Uh, um, <laughs> But they've got all three forms of government, checks and balances between the three, uh, all three um, used in our form of government to uh, try to, to negate the effects of man's sin in civil authority. Uh, that was essentially the, the purpose. Um, I'll, um, I'll have some quotes when we get to that point of discussing this uh, in two weeks when we talk about our, the founding fathers in our own government. But um, I want to say that it was, it was James Madison who said um, in writing the Constitution, do everything that you can to rein in the madness of men. <laughs> uh, and in other words, our Constitution written to do everything humanly that we can to rein in the wickedness of civil men, fallen men and civil authority. And so really our form of government um, was conceived with that in mind. You know, what can we do to keep this thing from falling apart? <laughs> um, we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. Okay. Priorities of Aristotle then, summarized. Governments should work for the good of the people rather than out of self-interest. Governments should be established by reason, not by passion. <laughs> Governments should not trample upon the liberties of the people afforded them by natural law, natural rights. A government should work for the good should be established by reason, should not trample upon rights. When government fails, that government must be resisted as evil. We're to resist evil. When government fails, and it fails to uphold those three concerns, it must be resisted as evil. Incidentally, uh, natural rights for Aristotle was grounded in purpose, right? Natural rights, 
um, flow out of the purpose for which someone is created or something is created, right? Um, and so people, in Aristotle's mind, were created for um, well-being. Um, the Greek word is eudomaya, eudomaya, eudomaya. Um, and that means well-being, that people were created for or exist for their own well-being. Later, that word eudomaya would be translated happiness by Thomas Jefferson, <clears throat> leading to one of our inalienable rights being the pursuit of eudomaya, happiness, well-being, right? Um, that everybody has the, the right, the God-given established, that's what Aquinas would say, God-given, the established right uh, to pursue virtue, to pursue well-being, to pursue excellence, to pursue essentially their happiness, their joy. Um, one of our inalienable rights. Our inal inalienable rights given to us by God, understood by Aristotle and Aquinas as natural rights. That theme of natural rights picked up later in the 12th century by the Decretus. We'll talk about them. Sixto. So where did the courts come in? Is that from that Thomas Aquinas? Uh, the courts, is that something that Thomas Aquinas or Aristotle considered, or is that something that wasn't going on at that time? Um, yes, they had been, um, there had been much written about the courts. Um, and I don't, the, the courts, the way they operate today, um, were not conceived of. Um, I, I think the way, like if our founding fathers uh, saw the way that the courts operated today, they would be shocked and appalled, right? Shocked and appalled. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to our founding, but the, the courts have existed um, in per perpetuity. Like it, it's uh, for millennia now. You, whatever law was in place, you had courts that um, would come alongside and um, adjudicate or apply the law. And so even under Aristotle or Aquinas, the courts were there, not conceived of as a, as a branch of government per se, um, but upholding law. So whatever the, the government whatever was dictated, whatever was put in place, uh, the courts were there to establish or to, to, um, uh, to protect, um, to see to it that the law was carried out or applied. Um, we see legislation going on in our court system today. And uh, we'll talk about that some soon. So yeah, the, the courts were a part of the thinking, um, but not conceived of as a form of government. So there to help or assist the government. Okay, uh, 12th century... Um, there's a, a group um, that was formed or began to be called the Decretus, a Benedictine, Benedictine monk, 1140 AD, named Gratian, um, wrote something called the Decretum. And the Decretum was essentially uh, explaining um, contradictions in canon law, so with the laws of the church, and where Gratian saw apparent contradictions, Gratian would explain the law theologically. And so in the church in particular, for centuries after, there were those who were called decretists who would study the writings of Gratian and would study these apparent contradictions and the way that the law applied to them. And so uh, Decretus wrote much about natural law or began to write about inalienable rights. Um, one of those being life. Natural law is we don't murder. You shall not murder. That's the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue's summary of that natural law. We know the law of God written on our hearts that we are not to murder, that life is uh, precious. And that not only are we not to murder, but the positive application of that law is that we're to do all we can to preserve life, right? It's, in other words, the, the Decalogue isn't merely a you shall not, but in joinders <laughs> uh, encompasses all, everything to do with that law, positive and negative, right? Um, one of the reasons that it is just and right to stand out in front of an abortion mill and preach against the murder of babies is because we're, we should labor to preserve life uh, and preach the gospel. And so part of keeping the sixth commandment is to preach at the abortion mill, right? Um, there are all kinds of ways in which we, um, thou shalt nots, 
are um, accompanied by and compel thou shall then. <laughs> um, both negative and positive aspects of the law. So life, for example, was one of those inalienable rights that the Decretus wrote about. Um, you're not to murder. Life is a gift from God. Because it is a gift directly from the hand of God, it is inalienable. Um, it cannot be um, renounced, cannot be given up. To give it up, to squander it is sin. Um, since life comes from God, no one can deprive us of it arbitrarily, including ourselves. Therefore, we must do everything we can to preserve life. Life is a right that exists outside of ourselves. It is given to us. Therefore, that right is objective versus subjective. Later, laws, rights began to be discussed in those terms, objective and subjective. Objective is that which is um, clear. Uh, doesn't have to be written, right? It doesn't have to be written down, thou shalt not murder right? It's a natural law. Natural laws um, began to be thought of as, as objective laws. Positive law began to be thought of as subjective. And life then becomes an inalienable right. Thank you, brother. Um, we see that in our uh, Bill of Rights, don't we? The right to life. Um, liberty was one of those inalienable rights written about by the decretists. The right to liberty uh, that was a concept that was employed in the Magna Carta, the right to liberty. Um, liberty is a gift given to us by God. There's debate over whether liberty may be renounced or not renounced, that um, uh, liberty um, uh, may be a mediated gift. We can talk about that later. Property was another inalienable right. So we have life, liberty, property, property becoming a uh, uh, is an inalienable right, that um, property cannot be taken from you, uh, that property is a gift from God. And for all of human history, we've owned property. Um, property, though, is something that is mediated. It can be bought, sold, traded. And so it's something that you can renounce for good purpose if you deem fit, as you steward your possession of property. And we see that happening all over the Bible. The Bible gives us good background for that. But the Bible also establishes property rights with respect to landmark laws in the, uh, um, in the Torah. Um, don't move your neighbor's landmark. That was always an issue of property rights. So what do we have? We have uh, inalienable rights, the right to life, the right to liberty, the right to property. Um, later, um, that right to property was uh, narrowed to a right to eudaimonia, well-being, and um, the right of the people to, in the words of Thomas Jefferson, to pursue happiness, okay? Um, laws then that restrict those inalienable God-given rights or civil authorities that restrict those God-given inalienable rights is illegitimate. Laws that restrict them are illegitimate. Civil authorities that restrict them are illegitimate. Uh, they're unlawful and should be resisted. Uh, and that's going to lead us up to the Reformation in particular and then our founding. Um, medieval, even in the medieval period, during this time, medieval canon lawyers, all the way back to Gregory, right? All the way back to the beginning of the medieval period, uh, canon lawyers, you know, the judicial system, saw inalienable rights as life, liberty, and property, or a pursuit of well-being, a pursuit of virtue, a pursuit of excellence. Um, religious liberty, obviously, included in liberty. And that anyone who stood in the way or restricted those rights was authoritarian, was tyrannical, was illegitimate, and should be resisted. Uh, and it was not only lawful, considered lawful to resist, it was considered um, sinful not to resist. Uh, it was considered a right to resist. Why? Because you're standing opposed to evil. Um, you're standing opposed to that which is unlawful. Um, you're opposing the spread of sin. Um, you're opposing harm, right? So, in other words, in, even in the minds of medieval canon lawyers, um, 
It was the right of the people, the responsibility of Christians to stand opposed to evil spread in this world at the hands of illegitimate civil authority or illegitimate rule, tyrannical rule, um, anything that would restrict the inalienable God-given rights of the people. And why is that? It's because we're steward of those rights given to us. Uh, we don't freely give those up. Um, we've talked about that in several cases now. Um, we have um, right to life, so to speak, so no one can take my life from me, including myself. That I have a stewardship from God. My responsibility for my life is between me and God. I have a stewardship of it, so no one can take that from me. Uh, no one can restrict my liberty given to me by God because I steward that liberty for, on behalf of, for the glory of God. Um, so that's not to be taken from me. That makes sense? So even during the medieval period, this idea of Christian resistance had been established, in particular now on the basis of inalienable or natural rights. Any final questions? Okay. History lesson gradually coming to a close. Next week, we'll talk about uh, the Reformation, and then the week after, we'll get into our founding. Yes. You said the middle, medieval times when this occurred with the um, uh, canon uh, lawyers. Uh, do you have any date around when that started? Really early. I don't um, have 1200s? specific. 1200s? Twelve, oh, no, 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 way before. So if you look back at um, um, even 4th, century. Um, yeah. So Gregory the Great. So uh, yeah, um, it, this, this, that kind of thought was sort of in germ form all along. Aristotle was uh, 300s, you know, so um, um, the, it was in seed form even at Aristotle's time and had just been slowly developed over a long period of time. Yeah. Remember, it was Aristotle who was writing about natural rights and natural law, uh, writing about those forms of government well before anything that happened in medieval Europe. And uh, so fascinating. Yeah. And he was really the only one before that, um, like Plato, others um, uh, weren't thinking about government in that way. Um, Aristotle was really the first. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's pray and get you out of here and we'll um, prepare for worship. Uh, Father in heaven, uh, thank you so much, Lord, for um, just the blessed opportunity we have to talk about these things and given some time here to develop them, uh, think about how you know, our brothers and sisters, how the, the church in, in centuries past have thought about these things and to, uh, in our time, uh, in this period of history, to cultivate our own theology of public life. Uh, help us to do that faithfully. We want to think, um, let this simmer and brew as it were, so that we can um, not rush uh, to judgments or be hasty in how we um, think about how the Bible applies in these circumstances, but that um, just given time to let these, this subject uh, percolate in our brain, so to speak, uh, we, we have the opportunity here, Lord, um, by your provision to us uh, to um, cultivate what we hope will be a, a way to faithfully serve you in our generation. With these things in mind, um, these are things that we can also pass along to our kids after us. And um, Lord, I pray that they'd be faithful in their generation as well. We love you. Um, this is for your uh, glory, uh, for the good of your body, the church. And we pray that you would bless uh, your people in and through it. And please, Lord, continue to protect us. Uh, protect us from the overreach of a tyrannical um, civil authority. Uh, protect us from being uh, faithless and overstepping our boundaries in um, uh, sinfully re standing opposed to civil authority. Help us to submit as we should and help us to honor you in all of it. We love you, Lord. Be with us now as we worship you in the morning service. May you be praised. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.